Welcome everyone to the September 3rd Board of County Commissioners. On my, uh, on my left is Commissioner Aaron Mays who represents District 3 and on my right is Commissioner Kevin Cook who represents District 2. I'm Bill Rippon and I represent District 1. Uh, first item. First item is item one, proclamation to presentations. Um, su school support during COVID-19 presented by Linda Oaks, Dennis Cooley, MD, and Chris Tuck, R uh, RN. Good morning, Commissioners. Linda Oaks from the Health Department. We have been meeting with the school superintendents since April, I believe weekly, to talk about how the schools can respond and operate under the pandemic. And it's been um, really helpful to meet with them. But um, this summer we added a couple more people to the team so they could be available for the schools. And that, um, as far as Chris, that is her only job with us is working with the schools. Dr. Cooley, we do have him do some other things with us too. So I asked them to be here with us this morning. I'm gonna tell you a little about them and let them talk to you about what they are doing to help with the pandemic response. So Chris Tuck earned a Master of Science in Nursing Community Health. She served as the Health Services Director for Seaman USD 345 and worked as a school nurse for 27 years. I have known Chris since working with her during the H1N1 pandemic, as well as several projects with the schools over the years. We always knew if we had a case of chicken pox or pertussis, we could count on Chris to be on top of it. Chris has been involved in numerous community projects also. She started working with us in the beginning of the pandemic as a case investigator. When I told our nurse supervisors I was stealing her for the school work, they were quite unhappy with me. She did a great job for them. She has already worked with several of the schools, and I think yesterday she was juggling four or five issues with different districts as well as working with Washburn University. All the school nurses in our community know her and respect her. And Dennis Cooley earned his MD at the University of Kansas and was a founding member of Pediatric Associates of Topeka in 1980. He's a much respected pediatrician and well known in our community. He has served as the chairman of the pediatrics departments at both hospitals over the years. He has professional certificates in disaster management and emergency preparedness and currently serves on the board of directors of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I have known Dr. Cooley through his work with the Immunized Kansas Coalition, and when we asked him for a letter of support for the Tobacco 21 resolution, he had it to me the very next day. He served on the case review team of the Shawnee County Fetal Infant Mortality Review Board. So I'm happy to bring both Chris and Dr. Cooley up here to talk to you and answer your questions about how we are responding with the schools during COVID-19. So Chris, you wanna come on up first? Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to educate you on um, what our role, what my role has been in working with schools. Um, as Linda alluded to, I do have an advantage because working here in the Seaman School District, I knew on a first name basis all the school nurses in Shawnee County. However, we also can't forget the private schools that we have in the county who do not employ a full-time school nurse and are also dealing with the issues that COVID-19 has brought into their school settings too. So my role as a liaison is simply answering any questions they have, could be working through a positive case, could be working through a suspected case, could be looking at uh, an athletic team, um, could be a, qu a question related to mitigation strategies that Shawnee County has um, guided the public and private schools through. So most of my day is spent at home on either the answering an email or answering a phone and getting a response back to them as quickly as possible. Um, Dr. Cooley and Dr. Pizzino and Linda have been um, a great uh, support for me because if there is an issue that is specific to a policy or practice, then I always um, ask them for their guidance um, because we are trying to create as much consistency across the county between all the public schools and all the private schools um, as that will certainly help to keep our students and staff healthy um, you know, as they're coming to school every day. <coughs> so do you have any specific questions for me that I might try to answer? Any questions? I don't know any specific ones, but thank you very much for everything that you're doing and being a liaison for the county to the school districts and making sure that we're all 
kind of operating on the same page. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooley, come up next. Good morning, and uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, present to you today. Uh, as you've heard, we've been very active with our school districts in making sure that uh, we that they provide a safe uh, return for students teachers and their staff. And um, I just want to right up front say that I'm just very impressed and pleased with the districts and all the efforts and the work that they've done. Uh, as you can imagine, when I first uh, joined the team, it was a few months back, we, uh, the first thing that we started doing was looking at their school plans. And we compared them, we looked at other school plans, say reopening plans, say in, in other parts of the country, we compared them with recommendations from places like the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, CDC, et cetera. And we worked with the districts, uh, worked very hard with them and, and making sure that their plans were, were going to be safe in reopening. And, and they were, I was amazed at, at how, how good these plans were. Uh, we reviewed them, we make recommendations to them. They were very receptive in our recommendations. And uh, as a result, I feel that the uh, reopening plans that our district have, have been, are very good. I think they're, they're as good as any in the country, quite frankly. Um, we've been involved with uh, the school districts in their extracurricular activities, sports, other extracurricular activities. We've worked with them in looking at the Kansas uh, High School Activities Association recommendations. We've also uh, worked with them as far as the national recommendations from the National Federation of High School Act uh, Associations, I think is the proper term for them. And we've uh, talked to them extensively about how to make those type of extracurricular activities safe too. Um, we've constantly been communicating with them and I think we have a very good communication with them. We, we meet, as our team, we meet with the school superintendents uh, and school nurses um, once a week on every Wednesday morning we meet. We discuss with them, we get feedback from them we answer their questions, et cetera. It, it's a great group, and I'll be honest with you, I enjoy it. I look forward to those Wednesday meetings because they're that, that uh, refreshing. Uh, Dr. Pizzino and I have both met uh, or attended one of the 501 school board meetings in the evening. We answered questions. I currently uh, attend a, a weekly meeting with the 537 district also, just there to provide information and questions. So I think we have real good communication with our, with our <coughs> districts and that is continuing. It just didn't stop once school was reopened. Um, currently, as, as uh, Chris was saying, we're getting a lot of calls. We get calls daily uh, concerning things like isolation, quarantine, those type of things. Uh, they're not as easy as they may sound. I can guarantee you that we don't just make decisions off the top of our head. We sit, discuss them, we try to find out what's the best way that we can make sure that everybody is safe. And uh, I feel very comfortable. It's a lot of work right now, and it's going to get more as schools reopen. But uh, I think that, um, that we have the uh, people that can help make that a safe, safe system. Uh, any, again, oh, and I just do want to say, again, I just want to uh, thank all the uh, school superintendents in our area. They really have a hard job. I'm gonna tell you, they're never gonna make everybody happy. It's just the way it's gonna be, and it's tough for them. But they, I can tell you they're hardworking and they really are trying to do the right things, and I think they're succeeding. So, thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Questions? Okay, thank you. Thank All right, you, thank you. Well, and I certainly don't want to forget to recognize Dusty Nichols and mayor, the mayor, Michelle De La Isla. They've also been involved with all these school meetings. So I just hope this has been helpful for you to know kind of what's going on with the schools. We have similar groups that meet with the long-term care facilities. This is all by Zoom, by the way, not meeting. We're meeting on Zoom. Long-term care facilities, the churches. We have multiple groups that we're meeting with regularly to help them navigate the, the pandemic so, and COVID-19. So I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point also. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we're using the word uncontrolled and 
one of our scorecards. I noticed it's gone down just a little bit this yes. week. Uh, that, that word had a tremendous impact on our community. We, we lost groups coming in to Topeka and uh, you know schools are making decisions based on that. It had a huge impact. Is there a way we can soften that? Is there a way we can give more positive news not just apocalyptic news that things are bad, but can we tell the positive things, the good things that are going on? Well, um, that, that designation is set by the CDC, which is why we're using it. We're okay. using their guidelines. So. They're, they're the same group that told us not to wear masks, then to wear masks, and then not to wear masks. Uh, and I understand that, but again, the science has changed. We have to remember things change. They're not marketing people. And, and we need to, to look at the message, I think, that we send out. I had a great letter from a, a gentleman, he's a business leader here in town, and he was talking about how he spends probably 50% of his time on what is the message that his company puts out. And I think we need to look at that because there's a lot of good positive things out there. We have new treatments, uh, uh, people stay in a hospital as much less. I, I was just noticing one of the statistics I got here the other day that I think you sent out and it, it has death by age groups. And uh, from 18 to 24, it shows that there were two <coughs> deaths in Kansas. But from 18, from zero to 18, it doesn't show any. That's the statistic that's important to schools reopening. Uh, uh, there were none. And you know, there are some good things out there. And I think we need to, we need to show that. We need to show some more balance. And that's what I would like to see. It's just more balance in how we present the message. Uh, we have businesses that are failing. This gentleman that wrote me the letter says he talks to two or three business owners uh, a week that think they're not going to make it through this. Uh, they've extended the governor's uh, 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 declaration uh, the other day. And in her emergency declaration, there were three things listed in there, but the first one listed was economic recovery. Now, I know you guys aren't in the economic recovery business. That's not your business, but it's ours up here. And we have to look at that, and we have to, we have to make decisions that help us keep the economy rolling. Sure. And uh, I, I, I would appreciate if, uh, before a lot of your messages go out, if we could have a chance to, to review those and just take a look and see if the message if, if there's some other way we can say what we're saying, to, but to look at the message and see if it's... We're happy to if, review those messages with you, Commissioner. We, um, we've done a great job of scaring people in the United States. There was a poll taken to ask the average American, how many people do you think have died from COVID? Have you heard about this? The average person said 30 million people, and it's, it's under 200,000, but 30 million people is what the average person thinks have died in the United States. That's horrible. And part of that is because we're not getting, we're not getting the message out. And uh, we need to do a better job of, of doing this. And uh, so I, I just ask you to let's, let's try to get some more positive news out there and, and to give it a little more balance. But other than that, I appreciate everything you guys do. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you for- Mr. Attention. Chairman, before yes. we go, um, recently the governor is going to start reporting where sites are occurring or where hotspots are, how will that affect what you're doing with the health department? Honestly, Commissioner, I don't know how that will affect it. We, we have a good relationship with our, especially our large businesses here. I talk to corporate offices every week for many of the companies, and I feel like we've done a good job of working with them. So I hope that it doesn't have a detrimental effect on those relationships. What I would say to them is, if you think you're going to be named, maybe you want to get the message out first, and we'll help you with that. So anything we can help folks be proactive, we are willing to do. So I, I think we're just going to have to wait and see what the result is of that decision. Mm -hmm. I learned about it the same time everyone else did. I mean, up to this point, outside of large clusters, we haven't named businesses. We haven't named right. um, occupations that have been uh, impacted by COVID, correct? Correct. And so I think, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a lot of people who view COVID as being the scarlet letter. That is a modern day scarlet letter to where if it's known that ABC company 
has had a case of COVID, that will have a huge impact on their business to the point where that may be even more detrimental. And so with the government now reporting where these are located or occurring, that may be something beyond our control. And I appreciate that we don't want to scare people and we should have a positive message. But I think the positive message goes back to the basics. Wash your hands, maintain a distance, exercise personal safety, don't take unnecessary risks, wear a mask. I mean, it's the same message. I mean, I understand you say the CDC has um, changed its rules and recommendations, but by and large, outside of the mask debacle, we've had the same message since day one, which is general, preventative, that's how we prevent almost all pathogens. Right. Wash your hands, maintain a distance, do a risk assessment. I mean, would you agree with that? Yes, Linda? I would, sir. I would agree with that. I and just, pretty soon it'll be get your flu shot. I was just pointing out that the, that the federal government's not concerned about our, our economy here. They, they don't care. That, that's not their, that's not their bailiwick. They're, they're into fighting a virus. But we have another front here. We have our, our economic war that we're fighting here as well. Would you have any suggestions on what we might do as a commission to change that? Well, once, let me reiterate that, that I, I think we need to get a more positive message out. Like uh, we've had a number of cases at a, at a long-term health care facility or nursing home. Uh, maybe the, the good news is that most of the people tested there didn't even know they had it, that were tested positive. I think that's a positive. Uh, how many of them were hospitalized? Not, not very many. Um, there are some numbers that just seem, you know how statistics are. If you torture the numbers, they'll tell you anything you want them to say. It's just like hospitalizations. They'll say, you know, 70% capacity on hospitals. 70% of what? Of the total beds in the, in the city? No, it's obviously not that. You know, they may have at the beginning had 100 beds set aside for COVID and you have 20 people in, that's 20% of the beds. Later on, maybe they figured, well, we don't need 100 beds, we've reduced it to 10, so you have six people show up and now you got 60%. You know, it's, those numbers don't mean anything until you know, have all the facts. But, but I think there's good things that we can tell. Uh, you know, like hospitalizations, it really hasn't changed a lot. When you look at the, the total number of people that we have in this county, I mean, going up four or five people one week, is, it's not a big deal. Uh, I think showing the statistics of what the recovery rate of, of this virus is, we don't put that out. I think that would be good information, that's but, positive information. But at the same time, Commissioner, again, with all due respect, we are walking right into a holiday weekend. And we have seen our largest upticks after large holiday weekends, whether it's Memorial Day, the 4th of July, and now going into Labor Day. And I think now our messaging should be more consistent that you need to take a personal, not that you can't live in, in isolation. I agree with you. We should not live in isolation. We should be out in the community, making sure that we're still part of the community, but you still have to do a risk assessment of what is safe. So. Well said. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. All right, what's next? Item three, consent agenda. I would move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon, second by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries three, zero. Next item. Item four, new business A, county clerk number one, consider all voucher payments. Commissioners, this morning we have vouchers that total $726,583.33. The largest expenditure out of that is our holding accounts with the state of Kansas of $204,514.82. Under public works or special public works, we have $116,560, which is Bettis Asphalt for the overlay of Wanamaker Road to on 47th Street. Under the information technology, it's a total of $93,378.87 of which the majority of that is SHI International Corporation 
for Microsoft Office. Under the equipment fund, we have $27,201, of which the majority of that is the painting of the Hillcrest Gym for $17,271. And then finally, under general expense, Mayor Crete, $13,200 for concrete repairs on the, Shung on the Shunga Trail from when we had the washout. I don't have any questions regarding the vouchers. We'll do for the approval. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Rippon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item A2, consider correction orders. I'll move that we approve the correction order. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Rippon, seconded by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item B, Parks and Recreation. Number one, consider authorization and execution of the following independent contractor agreements for services for two years beginning September 1, 2020, funded through the Park Services Division operating budget. A, contract C308-2020 with Karen Walker, Solid Rock Sound Machine for DJ services at a cost of $150 per event. And B, contract C309-2020 with Tracy Leonard to instruct art classes and workshops at a cost of $15 per hour. Good morning, Commissioners. Tim Lorette, Shawnee County Parks and Recreation Department. Yeah, before you are contracts for two intermittent employees. One is an art instructor. One will provide DJ services for some of our programs. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Can you talk to us about this item A? Um, I mean, not so much concerned about the B, the art classes. We have these contracts come through very routinely um, when we engage in services, but why would we engage in a two-year contract with a DJ? Well, I can think of right off the top of my head, I'm thinking about daddy-daughter date night. That would be one program where we would, where we would need a DJ service for that. Um, I'm sure there are other programs that, that uh, I'm not aware of off the top of my head, but uh, we only would pay this person when we had those events come up. So, I mean, we have these events come up, though, all the time. Don't we just routinely hire a person for each event? Um, you mean for a DJ yes. situation? Well, we could do it that way, but I think we'd still be entering into a contract, so we'd have to come up here and get that approved, if I'm not mistaken. Well, and again, I'm just curious why a two-year contract, and did we go out and, because there's a lot of different DJ services in the community, why this person for this length of time? Uh, I'm sure they, they've used that. No. Oh, oh, recreation dance house. Adaptive recreation uses this program, uses this service throughout the year, so multiple times is what Mike's telling me. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that we have a history with this DJ and, and we've probably used them in the past if, uh, and the amount is so low that, uh, well, but you know, the amount is $150 per event. Correct. And if you have, you know, three events a year or three, I'm sorry, three events a month, I mean, there's $450. I mean, this could add up to you know, close to $10,000 by the time you get to the end of two years. And $10,000 is usually our threshold for when you would need to go out for a formal bid. Under $10,000, but over $5,000 requires three phone bids. And so I, I'm just curious why we picked this person and what process we went through. Well, Again, I, I wasn't involved in that, so I, if, uh, I'd be happy to go back and get more information about the DJ services, and if we need to take it out for a formal bid, we'll do that. Again, I'm, again, $150 event is a very small amount, but when you add it up over two years, it could add up pretty quickly. Sure. And there are a lot of DJ services in the community, and if we're going to pick one, I think we need to say why we picked that one. I understand. Mr. Chair, w would it be possible to just put a cap on how many times per year? Could we do that as yeah. a question? Yeah, I we mean, absolutely to, to could ensure do that, that it doesn't go over the spending the policy. I mean, it seems like a pretty easy thing to do. And, and $150 per event, I've hired DJs before, and that's a pretty good deal. Pretty, I agree. pretty expensive. It, I, I doubt if we'd use $10,000 worth in two years, but uh, uh, maybe if you come, come back and uh, with a little more information, how Absolutely. many times you'll think you use a DJ and, and uh, just a few well, I'll do that. And, uh, okay, thank you. So, 
Given that, I mean, Commissioner Mays, do you want to put a cap on it, or would you like to defer item A to get a little bit more information? I, I think, I mean, I don't know. It's, we have to redo the contract probably in order for us to approve it, don't we? If, I mean, if, if we put the cap we, on it, yes, we'll need to redo I, the contract. I, would, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, you're the one that, that raised the question, well, so. Again, doing my quick math with my you know, phone, you know, if we had three events a month over two years, that's uh, ten thousand eight hundred dollars. But that that would be split up over two years, so that would be less. You know, that'd be roughly five thousand dollars a year, right? Which would be under the. Would still need informal bids. It would need informal bids for that amount. So if you were to say not to exceed two thousand or three thousand dollars a year, you know. Perhaps if I can find out the number of times and the actual amount, then we can decide what would be the best way to move forward, either with a cap or we, we go out for bid, you know, one way or the other. Could we uh, defer action on item A until the 10th, which is next Thursday, since we do not have a meeting on Monday? Okay. I would, uh, I would second that. So my motion, to make a more formal motion for our clerk, I would move to approve item B, one B, and defer action on item B one A till next uh, Thursday, September the tenth. I'll second that. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Ripon. All in favor, say aye. Those opposed. Motion carries three zero. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Next item is item C, Treasurer number one, consider approval of request to fill the vacant motor vehicle office manager one, pay grade 12 in the motor vehicle division and any subsequent positions which become vacant as a result of filling this position with funding by the motor vehicle funds. And uh, Mr. Mall, the treasurer is not available. He had something come up suddenly and so he asked if I would uh, present and just had, a, had this person leave. It is covered through his motor vehicle fund, so it's not taxpayer funded. And he just wants permission to uh, post this position so he can get it going because, believe me, they are busy down the hall. I would move to approve. This is not replacing a position. This is just filling a current position they have. So I'll I would second. move to approve. I'll second. Motion made by Commissioner Cook, second by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item D, Public Works, number one, consider approval of request to award bid to Central Salt LLC of uh, Lyons, Kansas for the purchase of up to 5,000 tons of de-icing salt in the amount of $52.05 per ton to be used during winter 2020 and 2021 on county roads and on Grove and Monmouth Township roads maintained by Shawnee County with funding from the Public Works Road Maintenance Fund. Good morning, Commissioners. Kurt Niehaus, Director of Public Works. I hate to bring it up, but we have to start thinking about this winter. And uh, in order to uh, perform the essential services that Public Works does during the winter, we need to have enough chemical on hand to treat the roads uh, during snow and ice events. As such, uh, we solicited bids uh, for uh, de-icing salt. Uh, we re re we received three bids, and the lowest and best bid was uh, submitted by Central Salt of Lyons, Kansas. This represents uh, a decrease in a little over $2 per ton from last year. Shawnee County is recommending approval of this bid, and I look forward to your questions. Any questions? No, I'll move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner May, seconded by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item D2, consider approval of request to issue a request for qualifications for professional design services necessary to prepare, prepare engineering plans, bidding documents, right-of-way plans, easement documents, utility plans, and cost estimates as necessary to either replace the existing bridge on Southeast Laurel Road over Tecumseh Creek or remove the bridge, close Southeast Laurel Road at the bridge and uh, construct cul-de-sacs with the funding from the countywide half cent sales tax for bridges 2017 to 2032. 
Kearney House Director of Public Works. Um, this project was included in our five-year CIP, uh, both in 2020, it was submitted in 2020, and it was submitted for 2021 five-year CIP. Um, again, this is something that's planned for 2022. Uh, on the screen in front of you is, gives a good location of where the project is. We have US 40 on the south, DuPont Road uh, on the east, and Tecumseh Road on the west. Uh, Tecumseh Creek uh, empties into, if I remember right, Soldier Creek, which goes about maybe 100 yards and em empties into the Kansas River. Um, yes, at this point, we're thinking of either removing the bridge and not replacing it or replacing it. No decisions have been made. But before we get into that in more detail, I would like to show you some pictures as I normally do. This is the bridge looking to the northwest. Uh, what you don't see in the picture is the creek is very deep. It's a V-shaped channel. Uh, it carries quite a bit of water. Uh, if you looked, I, I don't have a pointer with me today, and I'm not sure it would work with this system. But if you look to the uh, south end of the bridge, which is the end closest to us in the picture, left side of the road, you will see there's a pretty good gap between the bridge and the uh, retaining wall there, the approach retaining wall, the wing wall as we call it, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Here's a picture from the north looking southeast towards US 40. It's a wooded area. Uh, there, are, there are a few homes in the area. Once we get beyond the curve, uh, the, uh, the intensity or the, uh, the number of homes, parcels increases. increases. Uh, this is a good picture of the bridge. This is the north abutment. You can see there a vertical crack. That bridge girder sits on that parapet and uh, the load kind of spreads out uh, 45 degree angle on both sides and it passes through that crack. Uh, Am I saying the bridge is unsafe? No, but it's something that we need to address, and we address that by either replacement or removal. This kind of gives you just a general idea of the picture uh, or the type of bridge. It's a three-girder bridge. It's a T-girder. Uh, it's a cast-in-place concrete T-girder, and what that means is the top slab is part of the load-carrying capacity of the bridge. So it's very difficult to do any work on that top slab without compromising the structural integrity of the structure. And we're back at that southwest wing wall. And if you look down the, uh, the rail, you can see how it is slowly migrating out. If at some point in the distant future, it would fall over and we would lose our approach. That is another reason why we want to move forward with this bridge replacement or removal. Finally, uh, this is the south abutment, and it, if you look at the top of the picture, it shows you that wing wall that is kind of slowly wanting to fold out and uh, fall down into the creek. So with that, that gives you a good idea of what kind of structure we're working with and why we want to remove or replace it. It is posted. It has a sufficiency rating of 31.4. And to put that into perspective, 100 is a brand new bridge that was designed according to the appropriate standards. Again, we uh, want to replace or remove this bridge in 2022. Uh, as far as removal goes, we have worked with the school district. We have worked with the Tecumseh Township Fire Department. We are presently working with the township itself. We have sent out 92 letters to those individuals that live in the area. We have received 18 back. I will be honest with you, most of those are in favor of a replacement. But if you look at the big picture, the responses only represent less than 20% of the letters we sent out. Now, we have input. We are working with the community. We have input, input from the public. But now we need to look at the technical aspects. Can we replace the bridge? If we put a bridge in there that's of the proper length and size, 
Can we fit it in there? Remember, we have a curve just directly off the north end of the bridge. If we re remove the bridge and not replace, replace it, do we have room to put cul-de-sacs in there? These cul-de-sacs have to be large enough to accommodate buses, uh, school buses, and uh, fire equipment, uh, emergency response equipment. So these are all things that we need to explore before I can come back to the commission with a proposal. And as we're exploring the technical aspects of replacement versus removal, we will continue to work with the public and formulate what we consider a general consensus. With that, I look forward to your questions. Kurt, what, what's the speed limit on this road? Uh, it's, it's low. I think it's 30 or 35 miles per hour. I, I notice it's on a curve. Is there a, a sight line where you can kind of see this? Can you see this bridge when you come up on it? It looks very narrow. Well, oh, that's a good point. It only has a, uh, let me see here. It has a very narrow roadway, but it, it is not functionally obsolete because of the very low traffic counts. But it does have a very narrow roadway. In fact, the roadway width is only 20 feet. And as far as your question about approaches, if you approach from the south, from US 40, you can see the bridge quite a ways. But if you approach from the west, remember you've got that curve just north of the bridge. So the bridge comes up oh, reasonably quickly. Is it almost one lane when, when they meet, when cars meet? Oh, I think if you, if you were bold, <laughs> you, <laughs> You would be willing to uh, pass a car on the bridge, uh, but I don't know if you'd want to do it at a high speed. No. Certainly not a school bus, though. Certainly not a school bus or an emergency uh, equipment. Mr. Chairman. Again, no decision has been made. I'm sorry, Kevin. No decision has been made. We're, this is part of the exploratory <laughs> process. We have no <laughs> preconceived notions here. We, uh, we just felt like based on the traffic counts, and the number of alternate routes that people could take in the area that resulted in very uh, short detour links, uh, we felt this bridge was a candidate for removal. Yes, Kevin. Thank you. I was just going to ask her, yeah, again, today we're just about the request for qualifications mm -hmm. to go out to bid so that we can start exploring what our options are. Absolutely. So if you were to put out a message again today, your message would be, we have not decided what we are going to do with this bridge, but we're wanting to get bids from a qualified person to give us options. Absolutely. Again, I want to reiterate this. There's, it's not enough that we need to work with the community. We want to know what our technical options are. And in order to do that, we have to get a consultant on board. When you are going out to make that decision to replace or remove the bridge, and you're, you mentioned traffic count several mm -hmm. times, how does the county go about doing that traffic count? Do you just put out a, a strip to see how many cars pass? Absolutely. What we've done already is um, we've put traffic counters out on the pavement. We have uh, an individual in Public Works that has the knowledge to do that work. And so we've taken our own traffic counts. And then in addition, I think the state of Kansas has some traffic counts in place. Uh, I don't know how old they are. All I can tell you, the state says there's less than 200 vehicles a day. The traffic count we uh, were able to receive or get uh, was uh, approximately 50 vehicles per day. Now, uh, when you're doing the traffic count, are you measuring whether or not it's a passenger car as opposed to a school bus? We're not that sophisticated. Okay. In talking to the, uh, the gentleman that does that kind of work, he says you're not able to distinguish that. Now, if you had like a large truck with dual rear axles, there we could distinguish that, but a, probably a school bus, it was a single rear axle, we may not be able to distinguish that from a normal passenger car. That may be a critical part. I know that a lot of times when we have rural bridges and we have a low traffic count, it still is a critical bridge if you're talking about agriculture, if you are farming on either side of the bridge and you need to be able to get your agricultural equipment from one side of your um, pasture to another side and to do not have the bridge means that you would have to go all the way up to 40 and then back around. Um, that could have a huge impact on that agricultural business in the same manner if we're talking about school bus 
if you take your traffic count in June, there's not going to be any school buses on the road. But if you were to take your traffic count in October, you would be able to understand whether or not this is a critical route for a school. We do know it is on a school bus route. Again, we've worked with the, the school district and they are aware of what our potential plans are. Um, you're absolutely right about the difference between this location and a rural location. In a rural location, you're talking, if you remove a bridge, you could conceivably be talking about uh, alternate routes that are a significant miles in additional length. Here, if we remove this structure, you're talking maybe one and a half miles or a half mile for some people. It's not a significant uh, inconvenience to them. Uh, now, they might tell you otherwise, but uh, we're just looking at, uh, you know, what are the distances and length between this Laurel Road and an alternate route. Right. And I, I only bring up the agriculture. Mm -hmm. We did have that occur during the Willard Bridge um, construction that a person was farming on both sides of the river and to be able to get their agricultural equipment and combines, they had to go all the way to Westgate Bridge and then back when the Willard Bridge was under construction. Yes, that was an extreme example of a bridge closer significantly impacting the public. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, Kurt. Rather than have a cul-de-sac, I, I don't really like that on either of the mm -hmm. is there a way of just dovetailing into another road that's nearby or? or is no, there's, there's really not. The, that Laurel Road is kind of uh, all by itself. Let's see if I can, whoops, I can go back here. Uh, uh, it, there's, in the vicinity really of the bridge, there's no else. other road that, um, that you can use. Uh, on the north side, I guess you could. Um, but it's quite, I mean, I don't recall that first north-south road west of the bridge, I don't recall what it is, the title of it or the name of that road. It's too far away for that, you know, what you're talking about, yeah. uh, Bill. Okay. And on the south end, there's just nothing that you can back into. Um, so we would really, if we remove this bridge, we would be obligated to provide some kind of a, a turnaround. So your cul-de-sac would probably be can't see the name of that road. Like on, on, on the north one, you would just make that at the end of the road. You wouldn't try to bend it down. We would have to make it very near to the nearest entrance to that bridge on the northwest side. Because you would have to have something that everybody that has a parcel west of that bridge would, would be able to access. Conceivably, those people have a child that goes to a school in the school district and therefore would need a turnaround or a cul-de-sac for a bus to turn around in. Mr. Chairman. I don't, yes. I don't think it's ideal having buses backing into people's driveways to make a, a turnaround. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more maybe of a legal question. I know that when we vacated a road um, several years ago, there's a specific legal hearing that you have to have at that site um, and was one of the few times the county commission met at a site to vacate a road. But when we vacate bridges, do we have to go through the same procedure where we would actually have to go out to the bridge and hold a public hearing at the bridge to vacate it? Good morning, Commissioner. Jim Crow, Shawnee County Councilor. That's an excellent question. Um, I know that we've done a few vacations in my past, I'm not sure of the specific question if it's just a bridge, so we'll have to take a look at that. My sense is probably, probably the same procedure would apply, but let me get back to you on that. We'll make sure we'll follow whatever statutory requirements we have. Yeah, because there's one of the few times where the commission actually has to go out to view the road before they're able to take legal action. They can't do it from their chambers. I, I would imagine that's that's probably the case, but before I say that definitively, I'd like to take a look at the statutes on that. All right. Thank you. Curry, have we notified everybody in that area? To, we've, to get sent out, we've sent out 92 letters to what I consider the people to the north and west and to the people along Laurel Road that would, have the, that would receive the greatest impact to a closure. Okay. All right. I don't have any questions. I'll move for approval to the request for qualifications. 
understanding that that is all we're taking action on today. I'll second. Uh, motion's been made by Commissioner Cook, seconded by Commissioner Rippon. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3 0. Thank Next you, Commissioner. Item E, appraiser number one, consider authorization and Thank execution you. of contract C310 2020 with Geographic Information Services, Inc. to assist with the updated, the new updated GIS server configuration, tuning, testing, and other services as needed at a cost of $2,500 for 15 hours of online telephone consulting service with uh, funding from the department budget. Good morning, Commissioners. Lee Allen, GIS Manager. Uh, this contract is, uh, as um, Cindy said, is to kind of get us ready. We've, our current web services and applications are running on an outdated server system configuration. Um, we've <clears throat> been working with IT over the last, uh, uh, last bit to get our infrastructure built up on our new Nutanix servers and systems. We're actually going to be utilizing the uh, Azure Cloud as well. So um, this, uh, these consultants have experience with the cloud, specifically with GIS, and they're going to be able to help us make sure we can fine tune everything so that we do, when we do switch over th everything um, that the public will be able to access, we can hopefully do that uh, with, without any impact. So uh, for this, we did get uh, informal bids for this. The uh, GIS Inc. was the lowest cost per hour and also um, have, have great experience uh, dealing with these uh, <coughs> configurations. Any questions? I have none. Nope. I move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3 0. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Next item. Item F, facilities maintenance number one, consider approval of a request to submit a request for pricing for upgrades, upgrades to the existing uh, Siemens fire alarm system at Maynard Conference Center, 1720 Southwest Western. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Kroll, facilities maintenance director. Um, we've been having issues with the fire alarm system at the Maynard Conference Center uh, pretty much all summer. We did have Siemens look at it, and their recommendation is it just needs to be completely replaced. It's an obsolete system. Uh, based on their pricing that they uh, tossed back at us, it would require us to go out for RFP, and that's what we have before you today. Uh, I have been in contact with the city fire marshal. They are aware of the audio issues we're having with that system, and they want us to proceed, and they're willing to work with us and let us continue to use Mainer uh, with the system without the audio. The other parts of the system are functioning properly at this time so any questions bill are, are there other companies that do this i mean other uh, than siemens yeah I, I mean i you know you always hear you call a repairman and they tell you let me sell you this new system instead and so well one of the problems with this particular system it is proprietary so when heartland alarms who we have a contract with to test the systems went out and said hey the audio is dead we said well can you fix it and he said I can't because I can't get the parts because Siemens is the only one that carries the parts. So as we proceed with a replacement, my goal would be can we stay away from proprietary equipment so that anybody could work on it. Um, Siemens makes good equipment, wouldn't say that they don't. Uh, the system has lasted well over 30 years, so we're, you know, we've got our money's worth out of it. but. Um, if you can stay away from proprietary, you're usually better off because it allows other people to work on the system and get the parts that they need to do any repairs in the future. I agree. Thank so you. This is original equipment to the building? Yes. Yeah. All right. Actually, one more question, if, okay. if I may. So uh, this is only in Mainer. Mm -hmm. Are there fire systems in other buildings that we need to be aware of? We that, need to be aware the of thing? the Expo Center. Um, all that system, from what Siemens was telling me, was put in at the same time when the expo was originally built. So uh, they're probably facing future issues with that particular fire alarm system over there. At this time, and visiting with Matt Rockers and Kellen Seitz, everything seems to be operating fine. So you cross your fingers and say, well, you know, how long will it last? Is it possible to 
harvest the operational pieces of this to that use? That would be our goal, is okay. to take whatever parts we can to save them for the expo if they, if they can be used there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other questions? I'd, I'd move to approve. I was going to offer a friendly amendment. Okay. Um, if we can expand the bid to include the expo center as well, to have separate pricing for just main or conference center and then one that would include the expo center. Since we're undergoing the renovations to the expo center right now, Stormont Vandal Event Center, sorry, old habits <laughs> die hard. Um, and uh, that way we would know what we're looking at and as we're doing our renovations to see if we have any contingency funds left over um, to be able to do it all at once. It would seem to me that having a fire alarm fail won't affect you till there's a fire, and then it's going to be, you know, too late. So I would ask for a friendly amendment to expand that to include the expo uh, Stormont Event Center. I would well. accept the friendly amendment and just say that, uh, you know, I, I I hope we understand that it's probably not the intention of, of replacing it, but it'd be good to know at least how much it would cost. We we can certainly work it into a specification as we set that out to. And then I should I, I would. Probably like some clarification from uh, Mr. Crowell as well. Is is this an expense that would be eligible w for the contingency funds? If I mean, we we had that discussion last week on the contingency from the construction, but we didn't really discuss this. Good morning, commissioners. Again, Jim Crowell. Uh, yes, it would be eligible for. Um, we could use the current contingency that balance that's available for the project for that piece of it. Um, it's not something that they had prioritized at this point because it's functioning and you know we're prioritizing other items. Right. But we can certainly throw this into the mix and uh, it's been part of the discussion when we met with Siemens on this issue. Kellen Seitz joined in that meeting so we could discuss because currently they're all on the same basic system. So in order just to repair Mainer, which we need to go ahead and proceed on um, due to the f issues with the fire marshal, we will actually be separating that from the uh, rest of the facilities um, on that campus. But we certainly should explore, I think it would be prudent at this point in time to take a look at what the cost would be overall and put that in the mix with what we're looking at with Mainer. Okay. Commissioner Mace, I just, I know that during our capital outlay discussion or five year plan, there was a discussion that came up about the roof um, mm -hmm. on the event center saying, you're spending $48 million on renovations. Why didn't you think about the roof when you were doing all the rest of the renovations? I would hate to have the same critique in two years if the alarm system was to fail and the public say you just spent 48 million dollars on the building but you didn't replace the fire alarm when you knew it was out of date why didn't you do that and right. so i think it's it's i think it's definitely worth exploring i mean but you know there's only so much contingency funds and so right. we've now got the chiller the roof and the fire things as possibilities and it's going to be a tough decision right when sure. we get there so okay. uh, but yeah i would accept the friendly amendment but i think we still need a second right and then so. i'll second okay uh, so who made the motion? I did. Okay. Uh, motion has been made by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Next item. Item F2, consider approval of request to submit a request for pricing for trade service rates due to trade service uh, contracts, electrical, mechanical, HVAC, uh, plumbing, minor construction, carpentry, paint, drywall and trenching expiring at the end of October 2020. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Krolf, Summons Maintenance Director. Uh, the trade services agreements we started uh, about five years ago are coming to an end. Uh, they've been pretty successful uh, countywide. Almost every department's used uh, the various vendors that we've uh, selected for the trade services agreements. And, uh, but it's time to go out and see what the prices will be this time around. So ask that we move forward and get that thing going again. Any questions? No. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Rippon. Seconded by Commissioner Mays. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Thank you, Thank Bill. You. Next item. 
Item G, Human Resources, number one, consider approval of, approval of the following increases to the employee contribution rate at the 2021 health and uh, benefit plan year. A, 13 cents per pay period for employees only. B, $1.10 per pay period for employee child. C, $1.95 per pay period for employee spouse. And D, uh, $2.81 per pay period for employee family. Good morning, Commissioners. Angela Lewis with Human Resources. Uh, the Insurance Committee met August 18th. The Insurance Committee is comprised of the Core Insurance Committee, which includes myself, Betty Greiner, and Jim Crowell, as well as representatives from the unions and a member at large. Um, our recommendation is for a half percent increase to the employee benefits cost. If you look up on the screen, it shows you what our current cost is for each benefit, uh, what the half percent increase would be, and what the new rate is. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a quick question. Sure. Angel, I know we had, we had talked about this. One question I forgot to ask last week is, it looks like last year everything was rounded to the nearest quarter, mm -hmm. um, and there was no rounding this year. Is there a reason for that, or it just doesn't matter? or? The increase was so low at half percent, uh, we'd prefer to have a small increase rather than no increase at all because some years there are higher costs and it could be a huge increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Angela, can you talk to us just a little bit? Um, in blue, we have our retirees, and our retirees um, are significantly more than what our employees are. What's our, how does that work out that way? Our retirees pay 125% of our, of our cost. Um, it's so low for the employees because we have to realize that the county, the employer is contributing what will be 844.20. Um, there's no department to pick that up for the retirees and so they're paying the full cost. And our retirees, generally these are for people that are between retirement versus being able to qualify for other programs? Uh, exactly. They're people who have the gap before they're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Mays? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. I'll move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Commissioner May, second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 3-0. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Next item. Item H, Commission number one, consider canceling the September 24th Commission meeting. I'd like to make a motion to uh, uh, cancel the 24th, September 24th Commission meeting. I'll second. second. Uh, motion's been made by Commissioner Ripon, seconded by Commissioner Cook. Uh, all in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3-0. Thank you. Next item. Item five, administrative communications. Okay, at this time, Penny Department would like to make any announcements. Come forward. Good morning, Commissioners. Aaron Mahan with Emergency Management. Just wanted to take a couple of minutes to remind everybody that September is National Preparedness Month. I know back in March, we do severe storm season week, uh, so we prepare them for strictly weather. But during September, I would ask that every person, every household, business, uh, and entity go through and look at their plans uh, for any type of disaster, whether it be natural, man-made, or any kind of technological, such as a bridge failure, things like that, alternate routes of transportation. As you hear me talk quite a bit about with making sure that your go kits are up to date, and you've updated those, uh, those items that are in there. Within emergency management world, we spend a ton of our time doing planning. Uh, and once we have those plans, uh, then we write plan B because we know that plan A doesn't always work. Uh, and then after we're done with that, we go ahead and we write plan C. All of this is built off of the National Response Framework and the National Incident Management System that we adopted here in Shawnee County as our way of planning and response back in 2005. If you have any questions, uh, I would uh, urge people to either visit the Shawnee County Emergency homepage, or they can also check out ready.gov, www.ready.gov, which is a great resource for any type of disaster and planning scenario that could potentially come up uh, in the, the, the near future. Questions? Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Commissioner Mays, what have you been up to? Nothing for me today. Commissioner Cook. Just to take a brief moment, I want to thank all of our employees and volunteers that have been working for so many months. And I think from time to time, there should be a moment of recognition for all the volunteers that help make the county work. Uh, volunteers through our parks and rec system, volunteers with the health department. Um, our county employees make up just a small fraction of the actual impact the county has, and but the volunteers are what makes it that real personable approach. Everything from the contact tracers, the health workers, and also our parks and rec employees that really ward Mead and everything that they do. So just taking a moment to recognize all the volunteers in the community. That's a good point. We we rely heavily on volunteers, especially when we, in normal year we have uh, special events, but, but a lot of the gardening work that's done at Ward Mead and Gage Park, uh, Ensley Garden, it's done by volunteers. and We can't thank them enough. Uh, I know the health department, they've used a lot of volunteers this year, and, uh, and it's been stressful. So I, uh, I appreciate everything they do. Anything else? No. Commissioner Cook? Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, repeat a message we, we gave last week uh, or last Monday uh, on the census. Uh, fill out your census, get it turned in. Uh, it's important. Uh, it's how a lot of uh, federal funding is decided and uh, our number of representatives, all, all different sorts of uh, uh, decisions are made based on that data. So get your census in. Uh, Next item, I do have a, a need to go into executive session. I'd like to make a motion to go into exe executive session for a period not to exceed 15 minutes for the following reason. Uh, for consultation with an attorney for the public body or agency to which would be deemed privileged in attorney-client uh, relationship specifically to discuss Parks and Recreation Department. No action is, is expected at this time. So we'll head down the hall. Second. Oh, motion's been made by Commissioner Rip on second by Commissioner Cook. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, motion carries 3 0. We are now in executive session, session down the hall.
We are uh, officially back in session. No action is taken at this time, so we're adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen.